from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A possible new cash crop for southern growers. In general, we have the perfect uh, weather that is uh, good for growing tea. Look at the growing trend of growing tea. And as temperatures dip, prices rise when it comes to heating our homes this winter. See what's fueling those higher costs. And the big land buy debate. But, uh, uh, you know, who is buying the land is a big deal. The latest on the controversy surrounding foreign land ownership right now on Active. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Efforts to block a land sale in North Dakota to a Chinese agribusiness subsidiary have failed. Fu Fang USA is purchasing 370 acres of land in the city of Grand Forks to build a $700 million corn milling project. As Ag Day's Michelle Rook reports, a government review of the project did not raise enough red flags to block the proposal, and that has refueled the debate about foreign land ownership. Well, and the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States is the interagency body charged with assessing national security risks involving foreign investments. After a 45-day review, they ruled that the Chinese agribusiness giant is a private citizen and not covered under its jurisdiction. The project has been highly controversial due to its proximity to the Air Force Base plus espionage fears. However, foreign ownership of U.S. land has long been highly controversial. Although China has been in the spotlight, USDA data shows most of the foreign-owned land is held by other countries. Canada leads the pack at 32 percent, the Netherlands at 13 percent, and down the line, China only accounts for 1 percent, or a little over 352,000 acres. Overall, foreign investors own 37.6 million acres of U.S. ag land, which is only about 3 percent of the total. But that doesn't curb the debate or transactions. Uh, you know, I don't know anyone who can provide exact details of Chinese purchases, but that doesn't, you know, just because I don't know, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, who is buying the land is a big deal. The project has also prompted federal legislation. In August, a bill was introduced in the U.S. Senate to blacklist China from investing in or acquiring any U.S. farmland or agricultural business. Now, Raymond says that he's not sure it will have the desired effect. You know, whenever you make a law, you can find a way around it. Somebody will find a way around it. So, yeah, it's a hard thing to really keep under control. We've got, we've got foreign ownership of hogs, of, of re really every ag produce. Uh, so how do, you, how do you stop them from owning the land itself? I don't know. I don't know if it can be done ultimately. And until policy is confirmed, the U.S. farmland market remains open to foreign buyers. However, some states have legislation banning foreign ownership, and more is in the works. In fact, in South Dakota, Governor Kristi Noem and state legislators just announced proposed legislation to restrict foreign purchases of agricultural land in the state. Now, the plan creates a new board, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, South Dakota, which will investigate these proposals and recommend either approval or denial to the governor. That will be taken up in the 2023 session starting in January. All right, thanks, Michelle. We've been telling you about record farmland sales in Iowa. Now we're hearing that the value of all farmland in the state is at a record high. Iowa State University says one year after values skyrocketed by 29%, this year those values jumped another 17% or more than $1,600, now averaging $11,411 to the acre. You see that in blue on this graphic. Now that's higher than at any point since the university started surveying values back in 1941. And they say while inflation was a major factor that drove last year's big increase, it did not play as much of a factor this year as did commodity prices, limited land supply, and low interest rates through the summer. Look for another soy processing facility to be built soon, this time in Indiana. Bungie announcing plans to invest $550 million to build a soy protein concentrate facility in Morristown. The plant would go in next to the company's soybean processing plant there. It is expected to process an additional 4.5 million bushels of soybeans. Now it says the new facility is needed to meet the rising demand for key ingredients in the production of plant-based foods, meat, pet food, and feed products. Construction is likely to start next year, and it is expected to be up and running by the year 2025. 
That week-long winter storm that tracked from the west coast all the way to the east coast has finally passed. But what can we expect this week going into the holiday weekend? Meteorologist Courtney Jorgensen joins us with a look ahead. Well, last week, storms that went across the country have now moved off towards the northeastern portions of the country. But what does that mean for our jet stream? We become more of a zonal flow as we head through the week, but it does begin to change as we head towards the second half of the week. And that's going to mean big changes as we head into the holiday weekend. Look what happens by the time we get towards Wednesday. You can see those blue hues dipping down as we head into Friday and over into the northeast coast. That is going to be significantly impacting those temperatures. We have that uh, ridge building up from the southwest, though, going to be keeping us nice on the drier side there. Now, what does that mean for our temperatures? We are going to be much below normal for quite a bit of this week. In fact, quite a bit of this country, all below normal temperature. It is going to be rather cold here across the nation. Yields in the Fields on Ag Day is brought to you by Micro Essentials from Mosaic, the science of more. Discover our proven products. Text YIELDS to 31313. And what's a blizzard to farm kids? Well, just an excuse to have more fun in the snow. Tyson taking this photo of all his kids' toys in the snow near Sydney, Nebraska. That sure looks like a lot of fun. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Now, the arrival of colder weather is a stark reminder that heating costs have soared again this winter. The U.S. Energy Information Administration is projecting most households would see a jump in heating costs. That's based on NOAA's forecast of a slightly colder winter. The cost of heating a home with natural gas is forecast to rise 2% for the winter. Heating oil up 27% over last winter. And electric heating costs up 10%. Analysts say it's due to supply and demand and because of uncertainty abroad, such as the Russia war in Ukraine. As this war continues and as uh, nations choose to further sanction Russia, you know, that, that would have a large effect on the way commodities are produced, the way commodities move around the global market. And with lingering high inflation pushing up the cost of everything else from groceries to shelter, there's concern right now that prices could stay high for the foreseeable future. But there is some good news at the pump. Diesel prices appear to be on the way down. The Energy Information Administration reporting $4.75 was the average per gallon price across the U.S. earlier this month. Now that's down more than 21 cents from the end of November and the lowest price since the end of February. Now gas prices also falling to a 15-month low, now averaging $3.18 a gallon. And while the new consumer price index shows food prices at the grocery store are still rising, they're not climbing at the rate they were earlier this year. In fact, one USDA economist says prices for food at the grocery store last month didn't go up at all. That's the first time that's happened since November of 2020. So what's behind the slowdown in food price increases? Well, those experts say it's some of the same reasons impacting the general economy. Increases in interest rates, decreases in gas prices, so lowering some transportation costs. We've seen prices for unprocessed agricultural commodities decrease over the last few months. But some economists predict the consumer price index for food will continue to climb in 2023, just not as sharply. Organic dairy and other livestock farmers are asking for emergency federal aid. This comes as the industry deals with increasing organic feed costs, in part from the war in Ukraine, along with higher fuel and utility expenses. Those higher costs are on top of severe drought in the west and dryness in the northeast. National and regional organic farming groups have sent letters to USDA, the Farm Service Agency, and the heads of the Congressional Ag and Appropriations Committees seeking emergency payments. It was another mixed day for grains while livestock markets rebound on Friday. Michelle Rook joins us with Markets Now next. And later, Machinery Pete goes back in time to the era of boy bands, Home Alone, and modern tractors. A look at today's 90s horsepower prices straight ahead. And we have our first winner in the Case IH Holiday Giveaway. John Peters from Monticello, Indiana is getting this awesome Case IH prize pack. Congratulations, John. We'll announce another prize pack winner tomorrow morning right here on Ag Day. And the grand prize winner of the Farm All Seed Pedal Tractor will be announced on U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Almost $700 million. That's how much Oregon's Attorney General says Bayer has agreed to pay to end a lawsuit over PCB pollution 
associated with products made by Monsanto, which Bayer now owns. It represents the largest environmental related settlement in Oregon's history. It stems from a lawsuit filed by the state back in 2018. Now, PCBs were widely used in flame retardants, paint, caulking, and electrical equipment before they were banned in 1979. Bayer says the settlement fully resolves Oregon's claim and releases the company from future liability. The company also says the agreement contains no admission of liability or wrongdoing. Now, Bayer has reached agreements totaling more than $275 million to resolve similar suits with attorneys generals of Washington State, New Mexico, New Hampshire, Ohio, and the District of Columbia. Grains ended the week mixed. Michelle Rook is back with a look at markets now. Friday's market closes higher in livestock mixed in the grains. Arlen Suderman with Stonex joins us. And Arlen, as we look especially at that grain trade, uh, certainly a lot of dominance with a risk off environment in that outside market. Yeah, it really is. I mean, the fund managers are trading recession fears. That was uh, amplified again after the Fed came out with its statement last week. Uh, they fully expect the Fed to continue to remain hawkish for a while, and the market's convinced that's going to send us into recession, as it has been for the last year. And it assumes that in a recession, people consume less commodities. That's not exactly the same in a food-based sector, um, although we see in the meat sector, they will come down the value chain. There'll be a little bit of a shift from protein toward a starch-based diet, uh, but not as big of an impact as, say, the energy sector. Yeah, and like we said, recessionary fears part of it as we start a new week here. Are we going to be focusing in on weather or what's the dominant feature? Yeah, I think weather is going to really take more of the front center this week in the ag markets, uh, particularly in the livestock, but also with the cash grain trade as well. Some of these temperatures expected this week are going to be extremely low. It's going to make grain transportation more difficult, particularly in some of those areas that have already had a lot of snow, with some more snow very possible, especially in the eastern Midwest, uh, to create problems with transportation. Just the cold weather will be enough to make problems with transporting grain and moving grain, but livestock even more than that. Uh, it's going to affect performance of livestock. Uh, we started to trade that late last week, especially in the hog market, but also the cattle industry is going to be impacted this week as well. So it's interesting to watch when you get into the holiday time period and especially end of the year, you get a lot of evening up of positions here by a lot of these fund managers and whatnot, don't you? Yeah, you really do. I mean, the fund managers are like the rest of us. They want to take a little bit of time around the holidays. They don't want to be worrying about the markets when they do that. So they want to be able to square their annual positions for their books by the end of the year. So that does slow things down a little bit. On the other hand, it just kind of leaves the algos to, do, to doing their thing and allows for more erratic trade. All right. Thanks so much for joining us and happy holidays. Uh, Arlen Suderman with Stonex and that's Marcus. We have ag weather coming up. Contact Arlen Suderman by email at arlen.suderman at intlfcstone.com. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Closing Wheels provide quicker emergence and are more consistent in dry conditions than any other closing wheels. Order 12 to 16 rows today and qualify for free shipping or 20% off an end zone moisture management package. Meteorologist Courtney Jorgensen joining us. Uh, take a look at our national forecast. And Courtney, we finally got that low pushed out of the middle of the country, but Maybe more on the way? Absolutely. And especially as we head into the holiday weekend coming up, we're going to be seeing some big changes once again. And as we watch the jet stream head through the week, we can see what happens while we have more of this zonal flow. Watch what happens to the north. By the time we get towards Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're starting to watch this dip further towards the south. Much colder air will be filtering into the nation, especially for the portions of the northeastern. And you can see how wide this is. This is going to be windy. This is going to be wet. It won't be nearly as bad on the southwestern portions of the country, though, as we head into the holiday weekend. So this will certainly be making major impacts, especially for folks who are going to be traveling. As we had a look out there, certainly much colder air behind that boundary that moved its way through last week and into the weekend. It is going to be very cold across much of the country. Also looking at that snowfall by the time we head towards into Wednesday. High pressure off towards the southeast and into the southwest. It's going to be fairly mild out there 
for folks over on the west coast. Now, as we head on into Friday, we see that system moving into the northeastern area, and that is going to be bringing plenty of snow with it, certainly some lake effect as well, too. That is going to be impacting those areas. As far as precipitation, mostly the northern half of the country is going to be above normal. Certainly where we still need some more of that moisture, unfortunately going to be below normal as we head through the week this week. But as we head out to our temperatures, wow, it is going to be awfully cold out there. A good chunk of the country is well below normal temperatures. We're talking single digits and even colder than that in some areas, especially further towards the north. Nearly everyone is below normal. The only place that's a little bit warmer is the southern portions of Florida where they'll actually be above normal temperatures. As far as that precipitation is expected as we head through into next week, we start to see that uh, begin to drift a little bit further towards the northeast under that ridge and everywhere else towards the northwest will be above normal. And then as we head and look into our temperatures, still going to be on that cold side. We do get a little bit more normal to above normal temperatures as we head out towards the west. Take a look at these selected cities out your window. Wilmington, Ohio, mostly sunny and chilly, high of 35. Heading into Houston, Texas, showers likely high of 57. Polson, Montana, chance of snow showers high of 18. Farmer to Farmer, the Conservation at Work video series features real stories, real successes, real quick. See what's possible at farmers.gov slash conservation. Machinery Pete is taking a look back when it comes to tractors, and we mean way back. Well, folks, as 2022 winds down here, let's do a little shout out back to the decade of the 1990s. Now, that's a special decade for me. I got to become a dad. Our two daughters were born in the early 90s. And I tell you what, here in 2022, tractors made in the 1990s. They've had quite a year. Now let's start off our 1990s tractor parade with this 92 model Deere 4255, the very last one made. This sold on an auction in Lenox, South Dakota on November 26th, and it went for 142,500 bucks. Obviously record price there, folks. And I actually saw the same tractor sold on an Iowa auction back in March of 2011, had half the hours on it, and basically sold for half the money, 72,000 back then. Now let's stay with the green, and how about this 1995 John Deere 8100 two-wheel drive with only 113 hours on it. This one sold on an online farm estate auction July 26th in Old Shawneetown, Illinois. Went for $136,000, folks. That was a record price, 26 over the previous record from 14 years ago. And if we stay again with Deere, how about this 1998 John Deere 8400? 2,588 hours on it. This sold on a June 16th online farm auction in Compton, Illinois. Went for $133,000. And that was a record price by $20,500 over a record from 12 and a half years ago. Now, haven't forgot about you Red fans out there. We'll leave you with this 1998 Case H 8950. Just under 5,200 hours on it. Sold on a September 21st uh, Big Iron online auction from Orchard, Nebraska. Folks, this thing went for $120,250. That was $37,250 over a record just set back in the end of July. Quite a year for 1990s model tractors. All right, thanks, Pete. You know, they always say good fences make good neighbors. Up next, how a unique fence on this university campus might make a hot new trend. Producing tea in Louisiana and the southeastern U.S. is a growing trend. LSU Ag Center researchers are growing tea plants on campus that will serve multiple purposes, as Craig Gotro reports. While it may not look like it, Yan Chen is building a fence with tea plants. They're going to serve as a hedge around the perimeter of this uh, sweet potato breeding nursery. So when people come over here, they're not going to see the metal fence. They're going to see a beautiful uh, tea bushes. Chin has been researching tea for several years at the Hammond Research Station. The tea fence on campus will be both a research and teaching tool. We want to use this uh, as an opportunity to promote tea. And when we have a workshop here with specialty crop growers, uh, they can actually look at this. When the tea plants get large enough in three to five years, they will be used to demonstrate pruning and harvesting techniques. The southeastern U.S. has several factors conducive for growing tea. 
we have the acidic soil and we have uh, in general we have the perfect uh, weather that is uh, good for growing tea. The U.S. imported more than 13 billion dollars in tea last year and a producer in Louisiana found out there is a market for Louisiana grown tea. And they sold out quickly after it's available uh, so there is a high demand for locally grown tea. Chin will plant 280 tea plants to make the fence and use varieties that tolerate full sun and partial shade. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Ocho reporting. All right, thanks, Craig. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great week out in the farm country.